Well, I'm hoping that you have, you're about to notice another shift. The shift that I mentioned earlier was to the idea of what can we do. And I'm hoping that you'll see an even more significant contribution to what might be able to be done, what can happen, as we talk, or as we hear from and then talk with our next two speakers. Uh, the first of whom is Tony Lovell. And you can see on the back of your uh, program, you can see Tony's bio. And uh, you can read a bit about him there if you wanted to read more. I wanted to just tell you a couple of other things about him. Um, no, it won't be any of those, Bill. Unless, unless, if you know something, though, I can hand you the mic later. <laughs> okay. Okay. He's always had a connection to the land. and In fact, his uh, grandparents were some of the, er the early settled people who settled the tar area in southern Queensland. And uh, he too spent his teenage years on a farm, uh, on a dairy farm. So he has a, a, a direct recent connection in his life to working on the land. Um, what he does now is he advocates for and looks to increase awareness around the ideas of, um, of climate change and uh, soil and carbon and all those things that fit together and his aim is to do that with people who live in the city and uh, the bureaucracy, so the people who are actually setting the policy. So you can influence the policy, but they are the ones who are setting the policy, and you've heard that before. One of the key things that he's brought to the debate, and that which you'll hear over the next 45 minutes, is the idea that biology is important in the debate, that it is not just about technology. And so Tony will be using, talking about that as well. I want to just add one more thing to you. I'm not sure whether you'd heard, but um, going back to the centre of the Industrial Revolution in Manchester, which is often seen as the place where much of the Industrial Revolution began its um, start and then spread throughout the rest of the world, they actually ran, uh, they, pr they produced a report and the Guardian newspaper and the BBC set up an international competition as a part of that report to get the material for it. And what they were looking for was to find uh, 20 big ideas for working with climate change. And they were looking for billions of tonnes of effect. So billions of tonnes of effect. Not, not the small scale things that we can do individually, but rather the bigger scale things that can be done. Now, um, Tony happened to be over there at about the time that it was closing. It had already closed, they heard some of the things that he was talking about and said to him, well, you know, if we reopened the competition, would you submit? He said yes, they flew him over, he presented. His idea was assessed as number two of the items that could make a significant difference to what happens with climate change. So he comes to you with good credentials, with a sound knowledge and with a, a, a self-funded will to inform people about the situation in relation to climate change and to have the people in cities and bureaucracies understand what it's like in terms of the meaning that it has for farming and farming systems. So I'm going to ask Tony to join us now for his presentation. Okay, so I've got the deadly combination of the session after lunch and a fairly big build up, so let's go. Um, I suppose you handle. I'll handle it. Starting off um, introducing myself, the first thing is a couple of things that I'm not. Uh, number one, I'm not a carbon trader. Number two, I've never worked for Macquarie Bank. And number three, I've never been to Wall Street. So this is not about buying and selling and trading carbon. Okay, so I'm starting with that. Um, where we first started in this process probably about four or five years ago was a sense of frustration reading in the financial press all the time talk about carbon, about climate change and about the desperate need for high-tech solutions and whiz-bang ways to fix things. And what they were doing was they were recognising that the need to reduce future emissions is critical, okay, to move to low, low emission technologies, just be more cautious with the Earth's resources. But what they completely missed was the need also to support the biological side of things. Okay, and it's not that in travelling around and, and talking to people in Europe and in, in Copenhagen and in Brussels and various places at business type meetings, the interesting thing that I've found is when you're talking to people 
It's not that they didn't want to know about biology, it's just they simply forgot. Okay, in their, in their space, they've simply forgotten the fact that nature works. And a classic example of that was Tim Flannery was talking about a, um, a seminar he was presenting at. And afterwards, he was talking about biology and the, need, you know, the fact that we need to reduce, reduce greenhouse emissions, reduce carbon dioxide, sequester some of this stuff. And one of the people who was there was one of the world's leading professors of physics and said to him, you know, Tim, that's a fantastic thing. If only man could come up with some way to remove carbon dioxide directly from the atmosphere, that's what we need. And Flannery said he pointed outside at a tree and the professor just went, oh, okay. So he missed that piece. Okay. So I just click. Yes, it's forward on that side. Okay. But one thing that happens at these conferences and presentations normally when you've got technology people there is everyone's talking about the desperate need to move to a low carbon future. And everyone's keen to move to a low carbon future. I sort of tell them that I'm contrasting, I'm actually keen to, very keen to move to a high carbon future, it's just sort of like the carbon back out of the atmosphere and back into the soils where it actually is not a carbon pollutant, but very much an asset to us all. <laughs> a little saying, life on earth depends on six inches of topsoil and the fact that it rains. Okay, people in the city forget that, but it's absolutely critical. Okay, so the, the reason that this is important and, and our, my so probably passionate belief in this is that the, 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 the rangelands, the seasonally dry rangelands, which is this country around here on the globe, have the most capacity under change management to actually deal with climate change. Okay, so the people who are sitting in this room and people like you around the globe are directly dealing with this stuff every day and directly influence this. So it's critical that, that you get positive and enthusiastic about the opportunity this presents. There are some challenges there, but I genuinely believe that this is a massive opportunity for agriculture done well, and there's some changes that may need to happen, and we've spoken about that before with the changes over the last 20 or 30 years. There are improvements that are happening consistently as that moves forward. There's big opportunities for agriculture. I don't believe it's a threat. I believe it's a fantastic opportunity. Now, regard soils. Um, soil is one of the most complicated biomaterials on the planet and it sustains all terrestrial life. And I make a point when I'm talking in the city that uh, we are a terrestrial life form, so it actually sustains us as well. But we actually know very little about it in a lot of ways and we abuse it constantly. We expect that we can flog the hell out of it and it'll just keep going. Okay. There's more biodiversity on this planet below ground than there is above ground. Okay. As I talked before that um, there could be more weight of termites below the soil than the cattle on the soil. In a handful of fertile soil, there are more living, or living organisms than the number of human beings that have ever existed on this planet. So in that one handful of healthy soil, there are more living organisms than every human being that's ever existed. Okay, and this is the thing, once you start to understand it, that's where you get a sense of the power of this, because there's a lot of handfuls of soil on the planet. Okay? So, one of the questions has been, Human, climate change is a human induced, is it not? Give me something I can work with, okay? Just have a look at a couple of things of capacity. What people in the city do is they forget the connection with, with, the, with nature, etc. And what happens out in places like this is there's so much of it, it gets a bit overwhelming.